Dios. Hello, I'm uh, Barry Shaw from the Israel Institute of Strategic Studies, and this is the View from Israel. Some of you who follow me know that I became a non-believer in the uh, traditional two-state solution to solve the Palestinian problem. And the reason I switched from being a, uh, uh, an opponent of making major concessions to the Palestinians was really down to one person. That was Yasser Arafat. Arafat uh, promised the world uh, to give us a piece of the brave, and he ended up giving us peace of the grave. When we um, brought him back from exile in Tunis, helped him install him as head of the Palestinian Authority to commit to his peace agreement, and he inflicted on us something called the Intifada, which was the most massive terror campaign we've ever seen in Israeli history. I know about this because sadly, unfortunately, I became a co-founder of the Natanya Terror Victims Organization when Arafat's peacemakers decided to descend on my hometown of Natanya with their explosive cars, weapons, and explosive belts and suicide attacks. Um, so since then, I uh, have been a disbeliever in the two-state solution, which I've recently called uh, the international community dragging the dead camel uh, through the burning stands of the Middle East to a distant oasis called Peace. And I felt like a lot of Israelis who were supportive at that time of a, uh, a solution with the Palestinians, together with the Palestinians who were disillusioned ever since, that there has to be some sort of remedy to the impasse we've had for the last 50 years or more. And to help me in this search, I've invited a very special guest to The View from Israel, uh, Brigadier General Amir Avivi. Uh, uh, Aviv, welcome to the, Amir, sorry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Amir, um, personal curiosity, I'm, I'm, uh, I was interested to learn a little bit about your family background. Can you tell me where your you uh, arrived where your inheritance came from. Well, uh, I am what you you call in Hebrew uh, Samich Tet, uh, pure Sephardis from Spain. Uh, my family was expelled uh, from uh, Spain, and uh, from Spain uh, they went for a short period to Saloniki, and from Saloniki, in the beginning of the 17th century, they came to Jerusalem. And they lived uh, in Jerusalem since then. Uh, first in the old city, of course, there were no neighbors outside of the wall. And uh, when the first neighborhood was built outside of the wall, Yemin Moshe, uh, by Montefiore, my family moved to Yemin Moshe. And from there, they spread all over Jerusalem. So my so family has been living for a long time in Jerusalem. So you, you carry the stain of... Um global anti-Semitism, deadly anti-Semitism with you and found uh, your family found a home here in the in the Jewish state. So tell me also about your army career. Well, I served uh, 30 years in the army. Um, you know, as a young uh, child, uh, my father was a, a prominent diplomat and I spent from the first 18 years of my life, 15 years outside of Israel. I lived in Chile, Argentina, Italy, and graduated from a British high school. I returned at the age of 18 to Israel as a lone soldier. My parents were still uh, in Italy. And uh, I joined the combat engineers. And uh, I went to officer's course and uh, started a career as an officer. I was a company commander, a battalion commander of uh, combat engineers. And later on, I became aide de camp of the chief of general staff of Bogi Elon. It was the first time I had the chance to see things on the national level, uh, the decision making, the way it's done in Israel, especially in very turbulent times. And uh, from there, I became a, a commander of the Egyptian uh, border, and later on, deputy division commander of the Gaza Strip and the commander of the School of Combat Engineers. And in my last uh, position in the Army, I was uh, the chief auditor of the whole Israeli defense establishment. So 
I had the opportunity really to see the big picture. Uh, I worked uh, under a, a civil auditor and under uh, the Minister of Defense, and I audited everything from uh, the establishment's readiness to deal with Iran or Lebanon and huge projects, uh, budgeting and so on. So you've had a rich history of the uh, strategic uh, aspects of the IDF and the, also the, uh, the uh, policy making uh, decisions of the IDF. Um, so having left the IDF, tell me something about Habit Konistim. Tell me what this means in English for our overseas view viewers. Well, a bitchonistim in English uh, means the high-ranking security experts. Uh, in Israel, when you say about somebody who is a bitchonist, you mean he somebody who has served many years on the field, gained a lot of uh, experience, usually somebody who is very high-ranking. Uh, and, and this is us. We, we are an organization of uh, generals, of uh, field commanders, uh, young officers, uh, that spent a lot, a lot of time uh, in the field, uh, gaining a lot of experience, and we take this accumulated experience and deal with one major issue, how to ensure Israel will exist and thrive for generations to come. For me, it's amazing that uh, such a basic question, there is not a single organization today in the state of Israel or in the Jewish world that is solely divided like us, to answer the question, what will make sure that will stay around, that will exist for generations to come? What, what is needed? What are the red lines? And it's not only figuring out what are uh, these needs for the existence of Israel, it's also educating about that. We need to educate the general public and we need to educate also the policy makers uh, to make sure that this flame of Zionism and our Jewish state will exist and will thrive uh, many, many years from now. I, I, you heard me say that, uh, in my opinion, the two-state solution has been a 50-year failure. But I understand you have what you call the new state solution. Why do you tell us, first of all, let's tell us what the new state solution, why is this different from a two-state solution? Well, I, I would start uh, maybe uh, uh, talking before I talk about uh, solutions. I want to talk yeah. about the problem, okay? Because I think the problem is not clear uh, and, and I want to emphasize it. First of all, Israel needs a, a big enough country along defensible borders to exist. This means that at minimum, looking hundreds of years from now, we need uh, that our sovereign uh, border on the east will be the Jordan Valley. This is the only natural border we have uh, to defend ourselves and to give us a minimum of uh, width. You know, the, the state of Israel from the sea to the Jordan Valley is only 70 kilometers, 45 miles. This is the size of a city. It takes one hour drive to drive from Tel Aviv, from the sea to the Jordan Valley. That's it. Uh, one hour if you have a bit of traffic. If you don't have traffic, it can be even less. So this is the minimum for a state to be viable. Uh, now remember that when you talk about the state of Israel, these uh, 70 kilometers are divided in a way that 15 kilometers, 9 miles, is the shore where most of the Israeli cities are uh, today. Uh, 9 miles uh, is the Jordan Valley, and all of Israel is Judea and Samaria. So basically, who controls the mountains controls Israel. This is the basic understanding that needs to exist in order to understand what are Israel's needs in the long term. Now, where is the problem? The problem that in the middle of all that, we have two million Palestinians, or million and a half, two million, depends who counts them. And the question is, what is the solution? How can we, on one hand, be responsible of all of the land of Israel? We need, to, we need that for security reasons, and we need that also for national reasons. I mean, this is the land of Israel. This is where all our history is. This is where our religion developed. 
we cannot live here without being in the most important places for the Jewish people, whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's the tomb of our, tomb of our patriarchs, whether it's Betel, uh, or Har Bracha, all, all these important places, which are important talking about our heritage, but also important talking about our most basic security needs in order to exist. So there is one group saying, okay, if we don't want to have two million uh, Palestinian citizens uh, more in Israel and we want to keep ourselves uh, Jewish, we need to retreat completely from the Jordan Valley, from all of Judea and Samaria. This is the separation plan, or what you call the two-state solution uh, as it's conceived today. Completely different, by the way, by the original Oslo agreement. O Oslo didn't intend at all what is talked today. A complete retreat from uh, the Jordan Valley and almost all Judea and Samaria. Uh, and the claim is, if we don't do that, we don't have a Jewish state. And, and, I, and I must say, this is a completely false claim. I mean, there are many uh, countries in the world that are surrounded by other countries. You can take Italy, for example. You have in Italy three states. You have Italy, you have San Marino, which is a small state completely surrounded by Italy, and you have the Vatican. You have a state, a recognized state, the size of a neighborhood inside the capital of another state. So any, anything can be a state. So really, it doesn't matter what idea you bring on the table, the basic understanding needs to be, forever we will need the Jordan Valley in the most broadest sense. It's not only the valley, it's everything that controls the valley. Forever we need full security control of all of Judea and Samaria, and we need vast areas of Judea and Samaria to populate, we, uh, we need area to expand, we need this for national reasons, we need it for religious reasons, this is part of our national security. There is no national security without nationalism. So if we understand that, now we can start talking about uh, solutions. And there are two kinds of solutions. One kind of solution is the solution that tries to find the solution for two states only in the perimeter of the land of Israel, taking basically 70 kilometers and saying, let's put inside these 70 kilometers two viable states. Now, anybody with the minimum of common sense is supposed to understand that this is ridiculous. And it's not talking about Jews or, or Palestinians. There is no physical way to stick in 70 kilometers two viable states. It cannot be done anywhere in the world, especially not very big societies like uh, the Jewish uh, nation, which not only is growing very fast and in 20 years will be more than 20 million people, but we have millions of Jews outside of Israel who we hope will make Aliyah, will come to live here. We see the anti-Semitism around the world. We understand that many, many Jewish people around the world understand that they cannot continue living in Europe, in other places, and they are contemplating making Aliyah. We need to be ready to receive them. So we are going to be maybe in 50 years, 40, 50 million uh, people. Where are we going to put all these people? The same goes for the Palestinians. The, the birth rate in the Palestinian uh, Authority is high as the Israeli one. Uh, they also have diaspora in many places. So how can you stick two states in, a, in an area of 70 kilometers? It doesn't make sense. So the only way to really seriously solve this issue is bringing more land to the discussion. And the real potential for, for a viable, contiguous state for uh, the Palestinian people is not in Judea and Samaria for the very reasons I mentioned. Israel needs most of this area and anything that the Palestinians will have there will be surrounded by Israel. Israel will be uh, uh, in charge of the security. So it's not a very good solution. When people tend to disregard the fact that uh, half of the Palestinians don't live in Judea and Samaria, they live in Gaza. And Gaza is a place with two million Palestinians, and Gaza is an area with the width of five kilometers, three and a half miles. What future do they have? 
I mean, if we don't take Gaza and enlarge it, and the only place you can enlarge it is into the Sinai Peninsula, which is almost completely inhabited, uh, there is no future for these people. So the idea of the new state solution is instead of anchoring a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, anchoring it in Gaza, and then large Gaza into a portion of 10% of the Sinai Peninsula. 10% of the Sinai Peninsula is bigger than all of Judea and Samaria and Gaza together. So we are saying, we're not taking anything from the Palestinians they already have. They are controlling areas A and B in Judea and Samaria. They are controlling Gaza. Let them continue and control these two areas as they are doing today. But let's enlarge Gaza along the sea to an area uh, of 6,000 kilometers squared at least, which is 10% of the Sinai Peninsula along the shore. And there you will have a viable, contiguous, completely sovereign and free Palestinian state that can also absorb the Palestinian diaspora from all over uh, the world and the Middle East. And this is a real future for the Palestinian people and an excellent solution for the people of Gaza who are the ones who really don't have any future. The people in Judea and Samaria, the Palestinians can be civilians of their own state, just as it would be the other way. I mean, if you build a Palestinian state, even if it's a kind of San Marino state in, in Judea and Samaria, the Gazans are supposed to be a citizens of this state. So the other way also works. If you build a viable, contiguous, big, a state in Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula, the Palestinians living in Judea and Samaria can be civilians, uh, citizens of their own uh, of their own state, choose their own parliament, uh, and this is also something that exists around the world. The states that are not contiguous, even Russia has areas that are not attached to Russia. It's something that uh, exists and uh, can be a solution. This is the new state solution. It's the only solution, the only solution that suggests two viable states living side by side and not one inside the other or not two non-viable states and something that can work for the very, very long term. And I think it's time to think out of the box and look at new solutions. Before we move on to the uh, points of uh, uh, demography of, of uh, what you're talking about, uh, uh, talking from a, a security point of view, and also it, uh, it is no way of saying it, uh, certainly from a, also an emotional, personal point of view. I'll give you a personal example from here in uh, Natalia that I spoke about before. Uh, I live on the, uh, the ocean front here of the Mediterranean, but I uh, meet a number of journalists and some politicians from abroad who come to Natanya, including the BBC. Uh, and in the past, they uh, wanted to start their visit into Natanya at the Park Hotel, which has became infamous for the, what we call in Israel the Passover massacre, when a, one of Yasser Arafat's uh, suicide bombers came from uh, the Palestinian town or the Arab town of Tul Karam and drove into Natanya and blew people up as they were celebrating the Seder service in the Park Hotel. Um, so uh, just moving on, um, it, it was used to be a, 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 a tour of mine to take them from the Park Hotel to the local market, the Shuk, where there was another suicide bomber. And then I insisted to take them a drive east from Natanya eastward. And we went, of course, past across the traffic lights at the top of Herschel Street, which has a main uh, shopping mall there, where we had two suicide bombers. Um, we drove along the road a few more miles until we came to Baitley Junction, which is a junction of the north-south uh, inter, inter, uh, major highway, uh, of which there was also a double suicide bombing that uh, killed over 20 soldiers. And from uh, the Baitley Junction, as you well know, um, we arrived at the Six Road uh, on, on the edge of Tul Karam. Tul Karam was a hotbed of Palestinian, also Hamas, terrorism. Uh, the suicide bombers went out from Tul Karam into places like Natanya and Haifa and other places to commit their murderous act. And that drive from the Park Hotel going across the traffic lights took us 16 minutes. It was a distance of nine miles. 
And under the shadow of the necessary security wall, which was highly criticized by the BBC as being enclosing poor Palestinians into their own uh, uh, separate uh, area over there, <coughs> I had to describe to the BBC journalists that what we were doing was since that wall went up, not one suicide bomber came out of Tall Karam. So you can see, to emphasize what you're saying about the, the demographics, this was a nine-mile drive due west until we hit the Mediterranean Sea. So taking it further with regard to demographics, you, you mentioned Yitzhak Rabin. I'd like you to tell us about Yitzhak Rabin's less last speech at the Knesset before he was uh, assassinated uh, and the message it contained which regard to the demographics and the security needs of the state of Israel. So basically the two-state solution that is discussed today is completely contrary to what Rabin believed. This is not what the Oslo Rabin envisioned and Rabin they went to. Rabin got a, a lot of support when he was elected in 92 because he basically what he did, he embraced the ideas of Begin. At this stage, uh, there were no big differences between the Likud and the Labour Party. The idea was the same idea. They both agreed that there, there needs to be some kind of autonomy in uh, Judea and Samaria for the Palestinians. They both agreed that the Israel doesn't have an interest to rule them. They need to rule themselves. And they both agreed what are the national and security perimeters we need. Rabin, when he, even after he signed Oslo, in his last speech, he said three very basic uh, red lines. He stated red lines that, that were very clear and adhere to what I'm saying. He said, first of all, the Jordan Valley, it is in its most broadest sense, in its most broader sense, it's all the way to Shechem, to Nablus, uh, will be forever in Israel's hands. This is a place Rabin envisioned will have to apply sovereignty. This is our, uh, our land. Then he said, I will never ever agree to divide Jerusalem. If somebody wants to divide Jerusalem, I prefer war and not peace. This is Rabin. He never ever agreed to divide Jerusalem. And the third thing he said, he said, we'll have the overriding security over all of Judea and Samaria forever. And, and he understood that in order to do, you need massive presence of civilians. I want to be clear on that. The IDF is not controlling Judea and Samaria. It's the, it's the towns that control Judea and Samaria. It's the fact that you have half a million people driving every day on the roads that creates control. But it not only creates control, it creates jobs, it creates coexistence. The Palestinians today, all the money they get, they get from working in Israel and in the settlements in Judea and Samaria. This is the, econ the Palestinian economy, it's based on that. And the more industry, the more people you bring to Judea and Samaria, the more prosperous and successful the Palestinians themselves will be. So really it's not about physical separation, as some suggest, it's about uh, civilian separation, it's about who you, what kind of citizenship you have. The Palestinians should have Palestinian citizenship, and Israelis should have Israeli citizenship, and this solves the issue of not endangering the Jewish majority, because Jewish majority is about voting to the Knesset. Are you an Israeli citizen or not? We don't want two million more uh, Arab citizens. We want a Jewish state, and they want their own nationality and own citizenship. So now it's really just figuring about what kind of state they will have and where to anchor it. And there are solutions where you can build, as I said, some kind of like San Marino state in Judea and Samaria, but I believe that if they want a really sovereign, free and contiguous uh, state, this is relevant in Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula much more than in a... Uh, Judea and Samaria, and again, I'm not suggesting moving anybody, anybody from his home. Any solution I would suggest, I will never move one Jew or one Arab from his home. I would just solve the issue of the citizenship. This is the, the idea. Um, now, I, I want to emphasize something, Barry, and it's important. You talk a lot about uh, the Palestinian leadership, and especially Arafat. 
But I, I want to make it, the question even more difficult. Let's say that a new generation of leaders rises in the Palestinian Authority. Let's say that we have a leader that is really, really devoted to peace. He means it. He even does serious steps to, to promote this peace. Well, in this scenario, people would say to you, okay, Barry, listen, this is not Arafat. We have a new uh, leadership. What's the problem now? Why not retreat from Judea and Samaria, from the Jordan Valley? This is what we need to answer. What will happen if you have a serious Palestinian partner? And my answer will be still the same. Never retreat from the Jordan Valley. Never retreat from uh, the Jewish towns. Never give up full security control. And why is that? Because when you look at national security in the long term, there is one basic notion that needs to be understood. Peace, it's not forever. Peace you can have for 10 years, for 20 years, for 40 years. You, maybe you can have peace for 100 years. But at a certain stage, you won't have peace. And the, the basic question is, if there is no peace, if they want to fight me, am I... Uh, living uh, along defensible borders or not. And it's obvious that living in a state with the width of nine miles along the shore, controlled by the mountains of Judea and Samaria, and open to all the Middle East, this is the formula to destroy Israel. Point. Israel cannot exist in this scenario. So you cannot put the future of the Jewish people in Israel uh, on the notion that there will be eternal peace. This is the kind of uh, messianic way of thinking. We'll sign a paper, we'll give them land, and that's it. Now we'll have eternal peace. You know that in the book of Judges, and after again and again we had, uh, uh, we confronted the Gazans, the Philistines at that time, at the end of this book, uh, there is a phrase saying, and there was peace for 40 years. So, of, of course, uh, the question was, why would the Bible mention that there was peace for 50 years? Well, what's important about that? And the reason why it was mentioned in the Bible, it's because in the land of Israel, 40 years of peace is an event of biblical dimension. It happened only twice in the last 4,000 years. Once in the end of the book of Judges, and the second time was in the time of King Solomon, and that's it. That's it. This area has never had peace, and for two reasons. One, that Israel is located in one of the most strategic places in the world, maybe the most strategic place in the world. Uh, and the other reason is that this is the most uh, important religious place in the world. So there will be fighting over this land always, and any empire that will rise, any state, will want to control this place. So you cannot build on a future without building on a very, very strong uh, country with a strong army along defensible borders. If you don't have that, you are endangering the whole Zionistic project. You are endangering Israel, and we might find ourselves again exiled from our, our state as we, we, it happened to us twice. We cannot afford that again. We might not survive this again. And, and that's, this is why it doesn't matter who is talking to us. He wants peace. He doesn't want peace. He's serious. He's not serious. We need to understand what are our red lines. And unfortunately, the state of Israel doesn't have any red lines at all. Nobody's talking about that. Uh, only us. Only a bit honest team. Israel Defense and Security Forum. We're talking seriously about our long-term vision hundreds of years from now and maybe thousands of years from now what is needed for Israel to exist. And once we figure this out, once the society understands that, then we can move and talk about uh, peace solutions or arrangements or things like that. We, we have four different solutions, all of them viable, serious, also for the Palestinians. None of them uh, endanger the existence of the state of Israel as the, as the current two-state solution, as the idea of withdrawing to the 47th Armitist Line, none, uh, 49th Armitist Line, sorry, none of them. Um, Amir, 
If you were talking to the people in the international diplomatic community and explaining to them why the 1967 two-state solution is non as a non-solution, and would you do it by um, offering the need of the top uh, addressing the topography as the security needs of Israel and while you're doing it by the way I'm going to be asking Lawrence our producer to insert some of the uh, photographs the topo topographic uh, geography of the area as you're explaining it to our viewers so I think that uh, you need to talk about two things first of all the topography is clear um, the coastal area of Israel is completely, completely controlled uh, by the mountains of Judea and Samaria. There is no way to exist along the shore if you are not on the mountains. It seems even one, one anti-tank missile, uh, one, just one, anywhere on uh, Judea and Samaria will completely shut down Israel. So you cannot afford even one anti-tank missile. So obviously you, you need to be in complete full con uh, control of the area. But I think that it's a big mistake talking only about pure uh, military or security considerations and not mentioning uh, the meaning uh, of Judea and Samaria for the Jewish people. This is the very reason why we came back. All, all, the, all, all our history is in Judea and Samaria. If we are giving this up, we basically are giving up everything. Because it means we are giving up the very reason why we came back here. Uh, General uh, Reserve Gershon Akoen wrote a very, very good book called What's Nationalistic About National Security? There is no national security for a nation without sense of rightness, without understanding why you are here, what you are fighting for. You, nobody will give his life uh, for something he doesn't understand why, he's, why he needs to fight. Now, if anybody thinks that we can survive and thrive spiritually, I'm talking, uh, by giving up all of our national assets and just building some kind of uh, Manhattan along the sea, I don't think that uh, in this scenario, even if we solve some issues of security, which we cannot, there is a future for the Jewish people in, in, in the state of Israel. So we, we need to understand what we are fighting for. I mean, when I look at a, a town like Shiloh, for example, so I can look at it from a military point of view and say that Shiloh is located on the, on the backbone of Judea and Samaria, Road 60, the road of our forefathers. Uh, I, and, and this is part of an ecosystem of, of Jewish towns along this road that enable us to control the main road of Judea and Samaria. I can also mention that the eastern part of Shiloh uh, is part of the ecosystem of the Jordan Valley and controls the Jordan Valley, you can see the Jordan Valley from Shiloh, from the eastern part. But this is Shiloh. This is where um, our um, ark was, was for 369 years. This is a very important religious and historical place for the Jewish people. And we have to understand also this dimension. And, and we, as, a, as generals, uh, who don't only understand security and military issues, but we come with deep sense of Judaism and Jewish proudness and Zionism, we understand of the importance of spirituality, we understand the importance of, of spirit. It's not only about weapons, it's not only about how many tanks or airplanes you have. This is about our willing, your willingness to fight, to understand what you are fighting for. And if this is taken for, from us, that's it. It doesn't matter how many tanks we'll have. We, we won't win in the long term. Um, however, also, um, we at the Israel Institute of Strategic Studies, we made a brochure, uh, an illustrated brochure, which we called uh, um, Israel through the binoculars of a Palestinian intelligence officer. And one of the places we visited was a small Arab village called Rantis, which is just over the 1967 borders. And from that village of Rantis, we took photographs with ordinary cameras 
looking down on Ben Gurion Airport below our feet. We took photographs of the runway. We took photographs of the uh, the the buildings there at Ben Gurion, uh, ben -Gurion Airport, and we took photographs of uh, planes flying over our heads coming into land. And beyond that, we could see the whole highlight of uh, highlights of buildings, uh, high rise buildings of Tel Aviv. Uh, so I think the the demographics are vitally important from a security point of view. So I want you to um, uh, tell our, our viewers here about why the high ground in Judea and Samaria are so essential, both facing to the west, which is a narrow coastal base of Israel, and to the east, which is a very low Jordan Valley between uh, the high ground and the Jordan River, and also how that applies also to the area you're talking about beyond uh, the Gaza Strip, where we hope that the Egyptians would compromise and offer some of the territory over there, but retaining the high ground there as well. Why is this logistically, strategically important for any future solution? So as I said, uh, Israel basically is Judea and Samaria, with a bit of short uh, coastline and a bit of Jordan Valley. Israel is Judea and Samaria. That, that's Israel. This is why all our history is in Judea and Samaria. You cannot control Israel without full control of Judea and Samaria, without being sovereign in this uh, area. Without this area, you're basically uh, not controlling anything. And anywhere from Judea and Samaria, you can see all the way from uh, Ashkelon, the Gaza border, all the way to Haifa and the uh, Hedera. You see it with your eyes. You don't even need binoculars. So obviously, who controls the mountains control Israel. This is very simple. I mean, any officer you would bring from the States, from Japan, from Russia, and you give him the map of Israel and say to him, okay, listen, you need to control this area, you will say, okay, I will be on the mountains and I will control it. It's that simple. It's not very difficult to, to understand. Now, in the southern border, it's exactly the other way around. We are on the high ground. We are controlling the Negev Mountains. The Negev Mountains are a, a thousand meter high, a height, and they control the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. So basically, uh, if we anchor a Palestinian state in Gaza and the, 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 the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula, First of all, there we have huge strategic depths of the Negev Desert. And also, we are holding the high ground. So we are controlling from the high ground what's going on on the other side. And of course, the Egyptians will be controlling on the other side. So in this scenario, uh, of course, Israel uh, will be secure and safe, even if the Palestinians in this area will decide to bring an, a, build an army or whatever. It will be like uh, the border of Lebanon or Syria. We can cope with it. We cannot cope with a, a, an army a 100 meters or 500 meters from the, the biggest and major cities of Israel along the shore. This is something that is not viable and uh, will not able, uh, enable Israel to exist. So if we are talking uh, at the end of the day, the only argument, there is only one serious argument against uh, applying sovereignty in at least Area C, you know, in most of Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, the Jewish towns, and so on. The only argument is what will become of the Palestinians who live uh, under the Palestinian authority. And the argument is we need to give them Israeli citizenship. And this is not true. It's simply not true. There are many solutions where they will continue to have Palestinian citizenship, the votes for their own parliament, even if they are surrounded by uh, by Israel. The Trump's plan, and also the original Oslo, is an example of that. Trump's plan is an American plan, revised by the best international lawyers America has, and it says exactly what I'm saying here, that Israel can apply sovereignty in the Jordan Valley, that Israel can apply sovereignty over the Jewish towns, and there will be a Palestinian state surrounded by Israel, just as San Marino is surrounded by Italy, or uh, other places in the world. There are at least 30 states in the world that are in this situation exactly. So there are solutions okay. that we need to undermine our future and security. Yeah, oh, okay, but the, we know from our experiences that uh, President Trump was a bit more flexible, but a lot more festival in the way he viewed the Middle East. Uh, one example was the Abram Accords. 
But how do you convince, uh, let's say, the Biden administration, who even I, I heard uh, yesterday somebody from the Biden administration still talking, I think it was Blinken, Anthony Blinken, the secretary, still, still talking about the two-state solution. So <clears throat> how do you convert both the Biden administration and the European or, uh, or Union, not to mention the United Nations, who have been totally stuck on a failed two-state solution for 50 years to switch their thinking and take up a new sort of concept. How are you going about it? Our problem is not Europe and it's not the States and it's not the United Nations. Our problem is us. We need to decide what we want. And, and, and as long as we have, uh, we don't have serious discussions in Israel and, and we don't have a common vision uh, that every Israeli or most of the Israelis can come around and the Jewish people, we are the problem. Because when we go and talk, so I would go with my organization and say one thing, and then uh, another organization uh, of Israelis or Jewish people will go there and say exactly the opposite. We are not having serious discussions about the most serious issue in our existence. Uh, people don't, don't really go into details uh, people tend to politicize the issue too much, talk about people, uh, talk big words and not seriously understand the, the problem. There is a huge lack, lack of knowledge in the Israeli society, although we are talking about the most crucial and important existential uh, issue for Israel. Most of the people don't understand the issue at all, even politicians. So we need, first of all, to, to do our own homework. We need to build our own vision. And once the Jewish people will be united uh, behind a clear vision with some options for solution, I don't believe that a solution is a religion. One solution and that's it. As I said, we, in my organization, we talk about four different solutions. The new state solution is only one of them. So really we need to work inside our society and come to the world with a solution. Israel is not suggesting any solution. What is Israel's solution? How can we go and talk to in the States or in the UN if we don't have a solution? We're letting others push ideas and they don't understand anything about our needs, our national needs, our religious needs, our security needs. So we need to do our own homework and then we can talk about uh, convincing uh, the world. Let's convince ourselves first. Okay, so if you're talking if you're talking about the homework that needs to be done, have you has your plans been presented to the uh, the new Israeli government? Has it been presented, for instance, to Benny Gantz, the defense minister, who went last week to visit with Mahmoud Abbas and came back and declared himself to be the new rabbin? Um, has your ideas of the plans of the Bitchonim been presented to the uh, top is Israeli military uh, officers? Has it been presented to our politicians? Has it been presented to the Israeli Ministry of, Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz? This is exactly what we are doing. We are doing two things. One, we are educating the Israeli society because they need to understand this issue in depth when they go to elections, when they demand from the politicians what they want. They need to understand what they are talking about. So we're educating the young generation and the general public through the media, through social media, through many uh, meetings. Today in the evening I have, for example, a lecture like that to a group of uh, pre-army program. And we're meeting with the politicians, of course, with the minister, with the ministers, with the prime minister, with MKs, and uh, presenting our ideas. We're going to publish uh, next month uh, all the different uh, possible solutions that uh, we see, and it's going to be published to all uh, the Knesset. Uh, and this is a long-term work. It's, it's a, a long-term work, and uh, we are mobilizing our many officers. We have more than 2,000 officers today in the organization to do this uh, huge education program for the policymakers and for the Israeli society. Okay, but look, my impression is this. I, I started uh, our, our, our conversation uh, by reminding our viewers that it, it was um, so many years ago when the Israelis were, were behind uh, Rabin. They looked on him as, a, as a, a strong leader. 
one who wouldn't surrender Israel lightly to uh, the Palestinians or anybody else. Uh, and that blew up in our face. So once you've convinced the Israeli leaders and the Israeli public, I think perhaps the Israeli public who may be uh, tired of events at the moment and are prepared to give peace a chance on the right grounds, uh, what's your uh, thought of how the Palestinian leadership will take this? Because at the end of the day, everything has failed when it comes to the Palestinian leadership. In other words... You're convinced and going to con con convince the Israeli public who are going to be more easily convinced than would be either one of the dual heads of the Palestinian movement, whether it's uh, Fatah in Ramallah or Hamas in, uh, in uh, Gaza, who are both committed to a Palestinian state from the river to the sea. Well, I don't see the Palestinians changing so fast, and I, don't, and I think they will, for a very, very, very long time, be committed to destroy us. The importance of building a clear vision for ourselves is that it will enable us to do steps that are not dependent on the Palestinians. I mean, if, it, if Israel wants to apply sovereignty now in the Jordan Valley or in the Jewish towns or for in all area C for that matter, it's Israel's decision. It's not dependent on the Palestinians. And since we don't have a clear vision, since Israel doesn't know what it wants, we are not doing anything, and, and, and the situation is not uh, in status quo. On the ground, things are changing all the time. We need to take decisions, and to take brave decisions, we need to a long-term thinking, and we need a clear vision. We have a clear vision. We know exactly what needs to be done, and we are not afraid of uh, dealing with the consequences in the short term, because we are looking at Israel's national security in the long term. Where we want to do what Zionism has done from the very beginning, secure the next generation. So we need to take brave steps uh, in order to secure our children and grandchildren and generations to come. But for that, we need serious leadership and we need a clear vision. And this is what we are trying to push forward. Well, uh, Amir, I appreciate your uh, vision of hope for a new future. And I think that as you're uh, attempting to persuade and show our own leaders here in Israel and the Israeli public of a potential way forward, I think a lot of us who are involved in doing Hasbara public diplomacy uh, or even diplomatic diplomacy abroad should also begin to introduce an alternative to a failed two-state solution, as you call a new state solution, to make a switch in a lot of the uh, thinking of the in uh, international diplomatic community, the media, uh, uh, and some of the people who feel themselves uh, personally involved and invested in this, to give a, a new vision and a new direction. So, first of all, I, I wish you the best of luck. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of questions, and I hope you'll be available to me for any other questions and uh, chat later on as we proceed, as we go sure, forward. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Amir, thank you very much for, for allowing us to present your ideas, and uh, let's see how we can coordinate and progress forward. Thank you. This is uh, Barry Shaw for The View from Israel, thanking uh, Brigadier General uh, Mir Avivi and uh, the new solution. And uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you'll share this video. Thank you very much. Now, in, in order to emphasize the points made by Brigadier General Amir Avivi, I'd like to share with you a short video made by the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. This is the NGO founded by former Israeli ambassador, Dr. Dori Gol. And I think you'll find it echoes the conditions set by the Habitronistim, the top-level former IDF officers, in Israel's search for a secure peace. These are the people who have dedicated their lives, both militarily and diplomatically, to the security of the State of Israel. But before I show you this video, let me offer you my final thoughts. Let it not be said that Israel fails to search for conditions that will lead to a secure peace for the Jewish State. It's up to the international community to support acceptable solutions, particularly on the basis of those of the new state solution expressed in this program. And it must be their role to cut the Gordian knot 
of an intractable, untrustworthy and divided Palestinian entity who have contributed nothing of any honesty to a genuine search for peace. The international community shares a major role in the situation Israel has to live with today. Maybe in the age of the Abram Accord, the moderate Arab and Muslim states will be the ones capable of breaking the Palestinian Gordian knot. The Habit Konistim, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and our Israel Institute for Strategic Studies stand ready to meet with anyone interested and invested in a permanent peace of the Middle East on the basis of full recognition of the rights of the Jewish people to live in peace and security in our ancient homeland forever. Please, please share this video and do be in contact with us if you think that you can contribute to making peace possible. I'm Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. Enjoy the video. Every state has the right of self-defense and to secure borders to protect itself from hostile invasions and terror. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size, some of which are large bases of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. After the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 stated that Israel was entitled to new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley, Israel's eastern frontier, forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq and Iran. The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200-foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia Corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world, aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia Corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet it dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Missiles launched from the Judean hills pose an immediate threat to Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets, while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles more advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and a demilitarized Palestinian state. Israel's narrow borders means a combat aircraft can cross the entire country in under four minutes. In less than two minutes, an enemy plane could penetrate the country's airspace via the Jordan Valley and reach Jerusalem. In order to thwart an aerial attack on Jerusalem, a hostile plane must be shot down at least 10 miles east of the capital to prevent it from crashing into major population centers. Therefore, Israel must be able to identify hostile planes before they cross the Jordan River line and intercept them shortly after. To defend itself, Israel must control the airspace over the West Bank. 
Israel's transportation arteries, and in particular, the Trans-Israel Highway, enable travel and connection between Israel's regions. They also assure the mobility of the Israel Defense Forces in case of attack. Protection of these vital arteries is essential in order to ensure that 1. Civilians aren't victims of terrorist gunfire. 2. Regions of the country cannot easily be cut off. 3. The mobility of Israel's defense forces is not hindered in the case of invasion. To defend itself, Israel must control its main arteries of transportation. There is enormous uncertainty about future trends in the Middle East. Iran is determined to become the supreme power as the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. No one can guarantee the future of many of the current regimes in the region. Today more than ever, it is crucial to ensure defensible borders for Israel. Let's go!